Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we start a new unit on the founding of the Middle Colonies in America. And today's episode takes a little bit of a surprising turn as it focuses on the Dutch efforts to colonize this area. And it's an area that we today know as Southeastern New York State, the state of New Jersey, and the state of Delaware. While extensive primary resources exist after 1630, few documents are around to tell us about the Dutch attempts to settle the New World in the two decades prior. In fact, the Netherlands' relationship with the region dates back to 1609 when Henry Hudson discovered the river that today bears his name. In 1613, the Dutch entered a treaty with the Iroquois natives in the region, known as the Two-Row Wampum Treaty. While the actual text of the treaty has not survived, several subsequent documents have referenced the treaty, and they've also referenced the year 1613, which has at least helped to tell us that the treaty did exist. The first settlement in the area was Fort Nassau, erected near modern-day Albany, New York, well up the Hudson River in the year 1614. It served as both a military fort and a trading post. And I think it's interesting here to note that the Dutch did not uh, go right on the coastline. They went far inland up the river and made their first settlement. The fort was garrisoned by 10 to 12 men. It was a wooden structure surrounded by earthen works, which is a, basically a dirt mound. It, uh, it wasn't just some stick hut, though. The dimensions of the fort were 36 feet long, 26 feet wide, and enclosed by a 58-foot square stockade with two large cannon and 11 swivel guns. So it was quite the outpost there. And once again, just like in previous units, uh, the primary documents don't exist from that fort, likely because there was only 10 to 12 men there. Situations where there's more than 100 people tended to generate documentation that has survived the test of time. Later in the year, the United Netherlands saw the opportunity to utilize America to enhance its fur trade, so it issued a grant to exclusive trade for individuals who discover new lands in the New World. The exclusivity covered four voyages within three years, and it was limited to a handful of Dutch explorers, so only a certain uh, handful of explorers could go and uh, discover the, the New World and lay claim to it themselves. Let's have a look at the writing. In our assembly, having heard the pertinent report of the petitioners relative to the discoveries and finding of the said new countries between the above name limits and degrees, and also of their adventures, have consented and granted, and by these presents do consent and grant, to the said petitioners, now united into one company, that they shall be privileged exclusively to frequent or cause to be visited the above newly discovered lands situated in America between New France and Virginia, whereof the sea coasts lie. Between the 40th and 45th degrees of latitude, now named New Netherland, as can be seen by a figurative map hereunto annexed. And I wasn't able to get a hold of that specific map reference there in the in the charter document but I did go on Google Maps and if you're on the YouTube channel you could see it now I'll put it up and I outlined the latitudes that were being referred to by the document and the document mentions Virginia which is to the south of that area and New France which is to the north in uh, modern-day Canada but I think the Dutch may not have been aware of the Plymouth Company 
and its claims to the region which may make things interesting in the future. Now, Plymouth hasn't been founded yet. We had the failed colony of Poffin, which we talked about many weeks ago. Uh, so English were not really thickly present in the area. So, it, you know, it would make sense the Dutch would be unaware of the Plymouth Company. So now Dutch citizens have an incentive to go to the region, but colonies did not pop up left and right for the Dutch. In 1618, the fort, Fort Nassau, was abandoned because water runoff from the spring thaw severely damaged the structure. Later that year, the grant of exclusivity expired, so it hit its three-year mark. And when the Dutch merchants involved attempted to have the grant renewed, the government denied their request. This was important as it now opened the region up to more Dutch explorers and merchants who wanted to look at it. And as I just said earlier, the original agreement restricted it to just a few people. If you'll recall from the colonization of New England unit, it was at this time the Dutch asked the English separatists, later known as the Plymouth Pilgrims, uh, who were in the Netherlands at the time, and that's a story I tell in the prior unit, to colonize the area near the Hudson River. The separatists declined as they were looking to start a religious colony that was English. The next couple of years were rather uneventful, although we know that sometime in the year 1620, Captain Cornelius Jacobson May explored the Delaware Bay and gave the name of Cape May, which is on the southern end of New Jersey. In 1621, the Dutch saw themselves falling behind the Spanish and Portuguese for global trade, so they created the Dutch West India Company. And this is a company that I was uh, familiar with in my high school world history and college world history courses, so that might be where it sounds familiar. The charter was granted by the States General of the United Netherlands on June 3, 1621. The company was a private company with shareholders, and it was given a trade monopoly in the New World for a period of 24 years. The first known trade mission of the company in the New World occurred in 1623 when a ship sailed along the Hudson River all winter to engage in the fur trade, presumably with natives. In May 1624, the first group of settlers arrive under the command of Captain Cornelius Jacobs May. With him were about 110 settlers, but they were not all Dutch. Most of them were Walloon Protestants from Belgium that spoke French. They decided to rebuild Fort Nassau and rename it Fort Orange, right there in modern day Albany, New York. We think of America today as the melting pot of different nationalities. And in some ways, we think of ourselves as exclusive in that regard. But it's beginning to appear that the Dutch may have been that before America existed. Because they're not only taking in the, the Walloon Protestants from Belgium, they're taking in the English separatists from the Netherlands. May would end up becoming the first director of New Netherland in 1624. Fort Orange was not conducive to colonization, so the colonists were relocated to Governor's Island, a small 150-acre island located in New York Harbor, and Governor's Island still exists there today. In 1625, a second fleet of Dutch colonists leave for the New World. On board is Willem Velholst, who has been named the second director of New Netherland by the company itself in the Netherlands. So Verholst is uh, sort of like some people we've seen in prior episodes where uh, he is elected over in Europe and then comes over to lead. He's given instructions to take his supplies and settlers 
and settle on Manhattan Island, a place the Dutch name New Amsterdam. He was also instructed to purchase Manhattan Island from the local natives. According to writings of a settler, Verholst first met up with the Governor's Island group, so he first went over there. But seeing as there was not enough land to raise crops and cattle, he advised the entire group to move to Manhattan Island, which they did. Verholst's tenure as director would only last a year, and there's considerable speculation as to why he was replaced. Some categorize it as mismanagement because he was recalled back to the Netherlands, but some are not sure as the third director, Peter Minuet, assumed leadership much like Verholst, and there was a subsequent voyage over for Minuet. Peter Minuet would make history in 1626 by purchasing Manhattan Island from the local natives. Peter Shagan, a merchant, would write a one-paragraph letter on November 5th detailing the transaction. He said that the purchase occurred in exchange for 60 guilders, or in modern terms, $24. New Amsterdam was almost immediately declared the capital of New Netherlands. So the Dutch saw the benefit of Manhattan Island and how it would fit in with their colony. And in 1627, they would establish a new Fort Nassau located on the New Jersey side of the Delaware River, where the Big Timber Creek flows into the Delaware. So if anybody's familiar with that area, there used to be a Dutch fort there. This was also the year that the Dutch uh, began a trade relationship with the Plymouth Pilgrims, and we talked about that a little bit in previous episodes on the colonization of New England. The Dutch wanted New Netherland to grow, so in 1629 they published the Charter of Freedoms and Exemptions. The charter allowed for colonies of 50 people, ages 15 and up, to be established. The charter also provided free ownership of land to its occupants. However, the charter did reserve the rights of Manhattan to the Dutch West India Company. So you could found your colony of 50 or more, but you couldn't do it on Manhattan Island. The charter likely led to the founding of the colony of Pavonia in modern-day Hudson County, New Jersey, the following year. So now we have the Virginians to the south, the Puritan pilgrims to the north, and the Dutch smack in the middle in between. The colonization field is about to get more crowded, but before it does... We have to go back to Virginia, where we left off many weeks ago when we talked about the colonization of Jamestown. It, we took it all the way up to 1625. Well, now we've got to go back there and start at 1625 and continue that story. Because the continuation of that story tells us what happens next in the region. And we'll do that next time on Historical Context.